stand together now and let's turn our Bibles uh, to the book of Revelation, last book in the Bible, Revelation chapter 3. On Sunday morning, we're studying the book of Revelation together, kind of back into it again now uh, after the holidays. And uh, as we're making our way there, just a reminder that on Sunday nights, we go through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation. We'll look to study the Old, uh, Old Testament minor prophet of Micah, chapters 3 through 5 this evening. Also, we'll be partaking of the Lord's Supper. So if you're a Christian and it's been a long time since you have uh, partaken of the Lord's Supper, that is a command and there are reasons for it. And we'll be doing that this evening. And it'd be good for you to come out and spend that time just thanking the Lord and sitting at His feet this evening as we uh, partake of the Lord's Supper for the first time uh, this year. We pick things up this morning in the final of the seven letters to the seven churches that Jesus uh, spoke in uh, chapter 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen uh, and uh, uh, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. And so then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, and therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door, Jesus says, and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. And he who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Let's pray together. Father, we pray that you would give us ears to hear as your body and as your people today and um, the enormous price that was paid for us to have that relationship with you and to have this place in in life and this relationship with you that will go on forever and ever and so we pray that you would help us to hear um, the words and uh, the heart and the instruction of our savior through this letter this morning that it wouldn't come just in word only to us but uh, it would impact our heart our mind our soul our strength and demonstration of the spirit and in power and we pray and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. The city of Laodicea was within eyeshot of two other significant cities that existed in that part of the world at, at that time. The other two being Hierapolis and uh, the well-known city of Colossae. And this is the case in each of Jesus' letters that he writes to the seven churches there is something distinctive about their uh, natural situation, their physical situation, uh, that then he incorporates in terms of his <clears throat> instruction uh, uh, to them. And uh, so it's under, uh, important to understand a little bit about what made Laodicea unique, to understand, uh, fully understand what Jesus uh, was saying uh, to them. It was a very, very wealthy city. It was filled with uh, wealthy people. In fact, in 60 AD, when it was destroyed uh, by an earthquake, that's earthquake country uh, over there, uh, the uh, city of, uh, of Laodicea, the Roman Empire, uh, uh, volunteered to rebuild the city on Rome's dime and the Laodiceans refused that help and they instead they rebuilt their city at their own 
uh, expense. And maybe they refused uh, Roman money as kind of a, out of a good conscience uh, and uh, knowing that they had the money to do that. Or maybe it was a little bit of pride. We we're not going to uh, give the appearance of being in need. It was a banking center in the ancient uh, world. It was also famous for its wool cloth and its clothing industry. They raised this certain kind of uh, black uh, haired uh, woolen sheep in the countryside. It was famous for its softness, famous for uh, its color, and they produced this, and it was in demand all around the ancient world. And so it was a real money maker uh, for Laodicea. It was also famous for a medical uh, school that existed there, and uh, and for a certain eye powder that was produced there uh, that they exported in. Um, a tablet form which would then be ground into a powder applied to the eyes as kind of a cure for weak and failing eyes. You can imagine what a money maker that was since a weak and, weak and failing eyes will ultimately become uh, the uh, portion of all of our lives as we uh, move forward for it. So it would have generated a lot of money. But for all of its wealth, the water supply in Laodicea was not the best. And so the neighboring city, Heropolis, it had famous for its hot springs, Colossae, uh, famous for its uh, cold, pure uh, water. But during the hot summers in Laodicea, the river that fed that uh, Laodicea with water would oftentimes dry up and uh, they would have to have water come in from Heropolis and it would come uh, by way of a very long viaduct and uh, it made the water lukewarm as a result of that and then often polluted it making those who drank the water uh, sick and so Jesus incorporates the knowledge of all of these things uh, concerning them into his letter with them he describes their spiritual condition to us in verses 15 and 16 and uh, declares that like their water supply, uh, they were lukewarm spiritually. So we all know kind of what lukewarm, uh, physical lukewarmness is. It's when something is neither hot uh, nor cold. It's something that is uh, room temperature. It's something that has become the temperature of its environment. It's become like everything uh, else around it. Spiritual lukewarmness refers to the Christian who is neither hot nor cold uh, in his or her relationship with God or concerning the things of God. They're not hot and they're not cold in uh, their love for God. It is to be indifferent uh, to God. Uh, it's not an outright right rejection of Him, but there's no zeal for Him uh, either. And that kind of person may even go to church. They certainly did in Laodicea, but they had no zeal for God, uh, but no rejection of Him either. You notice Jesus' commentary concerning their uh, lukewarmness there in the latter part of verse 15 and into 16. He declared that He would prefer, and this is kind of an astonishing thing, He would prefer that they would be either hot uh, or cold uh, in their attitude toward Him uh, than to uh, be uh, lukewarm. And it's interesting that Jesus considers this spiritual condition of lukewarmness uh, to be even harder to correct in a person than if they were even cold uh, to God. The person who is cold toward God, even hostile uh, toward God, as the Apostle Paul was, for instance, on the road to Damascus, is cold for a reason. Uh, they're not indifferent, and so they are intellectually and emotionally engaged in their position. Uh, there's a reason for their uh, coldness, and as a result, it's very easy to engage uh, a, a cold person toward God uh, in a personal conversation uh, about spiritual things. But the lukewarm person possesses no such intellectual or emotional engagement in their uh, Christian profession. 
and they don't even care enough to be intellectually and emotionally engaged in their Christianity to begin with. And they certainly are not going to be uh, then interested in engaging in a spiritual conversation at all. And they're the hardest people to talk to. They're the hardest people to get through to about their condition because they're self-satisfied and they are indifferent. So you ask yourself, as if you didn't know what the letter was, though we've just read it, uh, how does Jesus wake them up to the danger of their spiritual condition? And he tells them and he tells us in verse 16 that their spiritual lukewarmness makes him uh, sick. And the idea is sick to his stomach, uh, sick at his core, and thus he promises to vomit them out of his mouth. Now, if you know anything about Jesus as he's revealed in the Bible and revealed in the Gospels, it's to realize that this is a, 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 a shockingly strong uh, statement that he makes here, one of the strongest that he makes in the entire uh, Bible. We think about uh, vomit, and the word vomit in the original language is vomit, and that's why it's translated uh, uh, that. So what does it mean to vomit something out of my mouth? Well, vomiting is the violent expulsion from a body of something that is making the body sick, something that is threatening the health of the entire uh, body, and, uh, and this lukewarm attitude that they had, Jesus is saying, not only makes me sick, but it represents a danger to the body of Christ as a whole. He never would want that to become the norm uh, within uh, Christianity. And that it is uh, inconceivable uh, and intolerable to Jesus that a created, finite, uh, sinful human being could ever settle into a condition of lukewarmness toward God. And stop and think about that. Uh, how that must be viewed by God. How that must be viewed, not from the context of the world, but viewed from the context uh, of, of heaven. And this kind of, of indifference toward uh, 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 God uh, it, it, because it can be so commonplace, even among uh, some Christians today, we cease to lose our horror at the condition. Uh, and that the, 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 our horror at the condition in another person, or even in our own lives as a Christian, and we lose sight of the fact of how great an affront that lukewarmness in the life of a Christian is uh, to uh, Jesus. And it's important to notice that these people were not lukewarm by disposition. You say, well, that's just the way that they are by personality. That wasn't the case at all. They had a tremendous capacity to be on fire for other things. They certainly weren't lukewarm about money. Uh, or riches, or about uh, 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 wealth. They were only lukewarm about God. And I mean, this is one of the most searching passages uh, in the Bible uh, related to Jesus speaking to uh, us as His uh, people in His church. Well, what kind of things does Jesus reveal to us that might, uh, as kind of contributing to their lukewarm condition? Uh, there's, there's reasons that are revealed in the letter for kind of how they got to this place, and uh, we want to notice those so we avoid those being characteristics within our own life. First of all, their indifference certainly speaks to the neglect of the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. 
No Christian can be baptized with the Holy Spirit and being regularly refilled and asking to be refilled with the power of the Holy Spirit to live the Christian life will ever end up in a spiritual condition of indifference, a me kind of attitude related uh, to God or Christianity or, or to lukewarmness. Jesus promised concerning the baptism with the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. This baptism with the Holy Spirit is the power to live a life like Christ. And no one could ever accuse Jesus of ever having been spiritually uh, lukewarm. And so the full dynamic of the Holy Spirit in our lives keeps us from ever becoming uh, lukewarm. And it is a a failure to uh, walk in the fullness of that dynamic that makes us vulnerable to being uh, lukewarm. And so there is that natural tendency in life concerning everything, for everything to move toward lukewarmness. For what is hot to become lukewarm, for what is cold uh, to become lukewarm. And it takes something not only in the physical realm, but this is true in the spiritual realm. It takes this work of the Holy Spirit in our lives that uh, keeps us, uh, allows us to resist it and and to give us the will to do and the power to do of God's good pleasure and and to remain zealous in our relationship with God. We notice too in verse 17 that part of their lukewarmness was due to the fact that they were self-deceived. You look at the massive difference uh, that exists between uh, their own self-assessment as a church and as members of that church and Jesus' assessment uh, of them. Their assessment of themselves is, I am rich, I've become wealthy, I have need of nothing, and so they're proud and they're self-satisfied. And uh, here's a group of people that Jesus declares, he says, you make me sick to my stomach, and yet they're so lifted up in pride, they think they're doing great. Now that, that is a deeply... Uh, deceived, uh, uh, spiritually deceived group of people because Jesus then declared them to be wretched, miserable, poor, uh, blind, completely blind to spiritual things. This is all referring to to their spiritual condition and naked. And of course, to be naked is is to be um, in a uh, a, a, a shameful condition. And to be, uh, to be naked in the Roman Empire was kind of, it, it spoke of the fact that you had become a defeated people uh, and, uh, and that uh, everything had been stripped uh, uh, away from you and uh, you'd been defeated, you'd been humiliated. And here is a group of people that have been defeated and humiliated spiritually. And, and yet they have no uh, shame uh, of, of their spiritual condition. They should have been the same way that anyone uh, would be ashamed to walk out in public, physically naked. Uh, uh, they should have been ashamed of their spiritual condition, but uh, they weren't. Well, how in the world does that, that level of a deception uh, occur? Well, we also see that they were woefully ignorant of the Bible. Clearly, they were not a well-taught congregation, and, uh, and learning what the Bible teaches uh, and not even close to uh, that being close to the priority uh, that it needed to be in, in the church or in their individual lives. You notice the two phrases in verse 17. The first one is, you say, and the second one is, and you do not know. Because as you read the letter, What they didn't know is what they would have readily known if they had any knowledge of what the Bible teaches uh, at all. 
One of my favorite uh, descriptions of the Bible, images in the, in the whole Bible concerning the Bible, is when James refers to it as a mirror, the mirror of the Word uh, of, of God. And James is declaring there that just as a physical mirror keeps us very well aware of our physical uh, condition, our uh, physical appearance, the Bible will make us just as aware uh, of our spiritual uh, condition. And so reading the Bible, studying the Bible, uh, doing it individually, doing it as a congregation, uh, is a vital protection uh, against uh, the self-satisfaction that accompanies spiritual lukewarmness. You notice fourth in verse 17, they were very materialistic. And clearly, they equated their material prosperity with spirituality. And so they, uh, this false equating of spir- uh, material prosperity with our spirituality or with our faith it's as old as time and unfortunately it is uh, just as present and uh, and uh, 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 today as it was ever then so you have today the positive confession movement or the health and wealth uh, teaching that our faith will always translate into material wealth it will always translate into Uh, perfect uh, health and that if we lack physical health and we lack physical uh, wealth it's because we lack the faith uh, to have it and so uh, when when you put that kind of a standard before people then people who are wealthy and people who are healthy number one people who aren't wealthy and aren't healthy aren't going to go to a church like that and so what happens though is people who are wealthy uh, when they view physical wealth as a mark of, of uh, real spirituality and God's blessing uh, in, in their life, and they view that as a, a mark of spirituality, uh, then, uh, then, then that becomes their assessment uh, irregardless of everything else. But James wrote, uh, in, again in his epistle, he said, listen, my beloved brethren, has God not chosen the poor of the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom which he promised to those who love him? And so our spirituality is never to be determined on the basis of our wealth. Our spiritual maturity is only determined on the basis uh, of the degree to which my life is being conformed into the image of Christ. And so covetousness, materialism, it is our killers of spirituality. Jesus declared, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal uh, to uh, the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Paul wrote in the same vein, but uh, those who desire to be rich fall into temptation and a snare. And many foolish and harmful lusts that drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many uh, sorrows. And so one of the problems with the prosperity doctrine today is that it legitimizes covetousness and materialism in Christians and it can then also produce a wrong assessment in Christians of my true spirituality and uh, and then resulting in spiritual pride which then inevitably will lead to a lukewarmness. I think that one of the practices of the Christian faith that protects us against covetousness and materialism and then the lukewarmness that so often attends it 
uh, is giving financially to God's wor work and all of the many ways that God gives us to do that. And each of these things that are confronted, uh, that Jesus confronts in this church, it is a neglect of some basic practice within Christianity if, that if they adhered to, uh, had it, adhered to it, it would have protected them. And, and giving is, is one, of those, uh, one of those things, not just for what it does related to uh, you know, honoring and, and blessing God's heart, but for what it does in us in, in giving. Jesus uh, wrote in the Sermon on the Mount, He spoke and said, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. And then here for our purposes this morning, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be uh, also. You notice uh, fifth, also in verse 7, that they were a self-consumed uh, church. I don't think that you can read Jesus' letter to uh, this church without being struck with how uh, self-consumed and self-absorbed uh, the people in this church uh, were. You notice that first word that comes out of their mouths in verse 17. Uh, I am rich, and the idea would be that I have become wealthy, and the I, further, I have uh, need uh, of nothing. And so the I, 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 uh, in, in how uh, they viewed things. I think that a sure way to become spiritually lukewarm is to become self-absorbed and to become self-consumed and, and, and self-satisfied. And because selfism and self-absorption and we used to call it selfishness <laughs> is uh, so nurtured within our, our culture is very easy to slip into uh, it as a church and then even to have it be nurtured within uh, the church and then if it is nurtured within the church then a church becomes a bless me club where we determine whether we're going to attend a particular church based solely upon what it has to offer me solely based upon uh, what it does for me, whether it makes me feel uh, good. Now, attending church is always going to make us feel good spiritually, but here is the person where, whether it makes me feel good in my carnal selfishness, as opposed to whether God wants me to attend uh, uh, that church. Jesus taught concerning the Christian life, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. He blows up the whole selfishness uh, thing in terms of, uh, of the kingdom of God. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow uh, me. And so no one can live a selfish life uh, or live solely or supremely for themselves and uh, experience the Christian life. Nobody can do that and ever become uh, like Christ because he did uh, anything but live a selfish or a self-absorbed life. I remember uh, years ago when the whole self-esteem thing really got going in, uh, in uh, uh, Christianity, and I don't think it's lost any steam at all, uh, but uh, it, 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 and started to, the whole uh, fad uh, going through and, and uh, teaching the importance of looking at ourselves and, and, uh, and, and the self-focus uh, for, uh, for uh, Christians as if we're not already self-consumed enough, just like everybody else. Now, remember they did an interesting thing in order to uh, justify this to Christians because so much in the Bible uh, teaches against it. But uh, they had a, a lawyer who which was a religious lawyer, uh, an expert in the law of Moses, approach uh, Jesus at one point in his ministry and asked him, what is the greatest commandment in the law, the law of Moses? And Jesus said, uh, first is the commandment, to love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your mind, all of your soul, and all of your strength. 
And he said the second is like unto it, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And then he went on to say, and upon these two commandments, not three, upon these two commandments hangs all of the law and the prophets. Well, how do you get around that? That my life is to be completely focused upon loving God with all of my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then loving my neighbor as myself if I'm wanting to live a self-consumed life. Well, they found a way to do that. And how they taught is that the glitch is in loving my neighbor as myself. And, uh, you know, I really don't think I love myself. And so how can I love my neighbor as myself if I don't love myself? And so the whole focus then becomes, I need to learn to love myself in order to love my neighbor as myself. And the problem is, is that once you go there, you will not have any time the rest of your life to fulfill the two legitimate commands that Jesus gave. And it's interesting, he almost, it's almost like Jesus anticipates it, uh, this coming I- into human history in this way, this self-absorption and its attempt to even take over Christianity when he said, upon these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. And so these, the, uh, these attempts uh, that are sometimes made in order to accommodate uh, being self-absorbed uh, as, in, in the way that the church at uh, Laodicea was. At about that time, there were a lot of people that were church shopping, and I don't have any problem. People, God moves His people around churches in town all the time. I don't consider that to be church shopping, but, uh, but people kind of church shopping from a very carnal, very selfish uh, perspective. And so, uh, I remember all of it encapsulated in a incident that happened to a, past, uh, a, a, a Calvary pastor uh, who I know and is a friend. And, and uh, he spoke about the fact that he'd gotten done teaching on a Sunday morning, goes to the back door to greet people and, and so forth. And, and a man uh, came up to him as he's standing at the back door and he said, I just came to see what you had to offer. And the pastor apparently had a kind of enough of this, and there was a lot of that going on uh, at at that time. And uh, he shot right back at him, well, what do you have to offer? And uh, it was a good word. And it was a good word then, and it's a good word uh, now, because all of this I, me, my thinking and attitude uh, in and, uh, and, and out of the culture and uh, uh, is uh, pr- as prevalent today as ever. And this tendency towards selfishness and the uh, spiritual lukewarmness that will ultimately uh, always accompany it speaks of the wisdom uh, of the importance of Christian service uh, in the Christian life. Uh, Again, it's built in. There's a neglect here that is is a part of their lukewarmness. And every time we say no to ourselves in serving uh, uh, God and in serving other people, uh, then we say, are saying, uh, uh, in, in order to say yes to God and to serving other people, then a little bit more of my selfishness uh, dies. And I don't know about you, but I have an awful lot of selfishness that needs to die. And, and this is uh, one of the ways that, uh, that occurs. Number six in verse 17 and also represented in verse 20 is that they were very much a man-centered Uh, church rather than a God-centered church. And so much so uh, that in verse 20, Jesus is on the outside of the church and knocking to get in, and they don't have the foggiest idea that there is anything wrong with that picture. In fact, they are so content to have it be so that they have no sense that they are missing anything significant in the absence of God in their gatherings. And they, uh, 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 that they have suffered any loss at all in His absence 
as the central focus of their church. It's interesting to realize that the Laodicea means literally uh, the people rule or the rights of the people. And in this regard, the church certainly had become like the community uh, around them. The people ruled the church, not God, because God would have never produced such a church. And he would never produce such a Christian that he could be on the outside and need to knock in uh, on the door to be allowed in 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 what he has purchased with his his own blood and one of the uh, it's not like uh, again these people uh, don't like church they clearly like church Uh, they just don't want it to be about god Uh, They want it to be about them, the worship of self. In other words, to be like everything else in the world with just a little religiosity uh, sprinkled on it. And the problem is the degree to which any church is man-centered is the degree to which it is not uh, God-centered. And I remember as I'm uh, thinking about the church growth literature that uh, I I used to uh, read. I don't read it anymore. Uh, Stopped doing that a few years ago. Um, But uh, the the, uh, church growth literature that would uh, come to me where uh, almost uniformly the emphasis was never in terms of growing the church, uh, never based upon what God wanted, but upon what people want. And you better give it to them, uh, or you're going to be left in the dust in, in your uh, uh, community. And at Laodicea, the greatest consideration in their decision making was not what God wanted in the church, what would please Him, but what do people want and what would please them. And you get that thinking in the mind of a pastor or the leadership of a church, or the worship team of the church, and in their preparations for uh, church services, their greatest concern is not with what God wants, but what will the people want? And uh, you got a church that's headed in uh, the polar opposite direction of where uh, it should be uh, happening. And you're ultimately, you'll end up, uh, the sermons will uh, become what uh, people want to hear and uh, specifically about themselves uh, uh, rather than uh, learning about God and, and how to know Him, how to bless Him. And so sermons become about how to achieve your potential, uh, how to be successful in business, how to become influential with other people, three keys to achieving happiness and this kind of thing. And then the worship music, pretty soon you begin to discover more and more it becomes about the worshiper rather than the God who is being worshipped. And the lyrics are now filled with more I, me, my uh, than they are about God and and about saying anything substantial about God, giving us any uh, any reason to worship Him in their description uh, of him and the success of the worship service is judged by how it made me feel supremely what it did for me and and uh, and of course god is never going to be uh, nobody's ever going to outgive god we will always be blessed in in giving him our our worship and our praise but here we're talking about just the the carnality what did that do for me uh, carnally in in that uh, in that service as opposed to whether that service or my worship blessed uh, him and what happens in a church of Laodicea is that it goes along for a while and then pretty soon people begin to wonder where is God in all of this I thought this was supposed to be about God what happened to God in Christianity and in, in uh, uh, the Christian church. And so it inevitably leads to a lukewarmness in a relationship with God because He is no longer the center uh, of the church or the center of the lives of those who are attending the church. Now you notice Jesus' self-description in verse 14. And His self-description always, uh, He reminds them of something that they have forgotten about Him 
uh, that is, uh, plays into the fact that they're in the condition that they're in. So he comes to them in a threefold way. He reminds them that he is the Amen. And Amen means that's the truth or so be it. And uh, Jesus reminds them that He is the truth. He is the embodiment of truth in all that He spoke. He is the embodiment of truth in the life that He lived. And to deny Him His rightful place within uh, the church uh, as its head and as its focus is to abandon spiritual truth. You're going to replace it with something. And, and it is to abandon uh, the truth. He tells them that he is the faithful and true witness. In other words, that he is completely uh, faithful. He is completely trustworthy uh, in, in contrast to uh, their unfaithfulness and untrustworthiness. And he declared himself further to be the beginning of the creation of God. And the word beginning is the idea of the source or the origin of the creation of God. And what Jesus is doing here is He is confronting them with the folly of worshiping uh, the creation in the form of their riches and in the form of their wealth as opposed to worshiping the One who created all things, including uh, riches and wealth. And so you imagine missing out on a relationship with God and all that He alone can be in our lives and, and being content with money as a satisfactory replacement for God. I, 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 that, is a, that is to be really lukewarm, to think that money or wealth and the focus upon it within a church could ever accomplish in my life what only God can accomplish in my life. You have to be very lukewarm to come to that kind of a conclusion. Jesus' counsel to them is found in uh, variously in 18, verse 18, 19, and 20. In verse 18, he said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Remember, Laodicea was a great banking center uh, of, of the ancient world, so they possessed great material wealth. And Jesus calls the ch upon the church to turn to him for the things that money can't buy and that all of the money in the world uh, can't buy. One of those things being, as Peter puts it in his first epistle, a living, purified, genuine faith in God. No matter what it costs for that to be developed in me and for me to walk in that, as opposed to this kind of fool's gold uh, uh, Christianity that they were presently uh, so impressed with. And then you notice that Jesus says in verse 18, I counsel you to buy from me white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. Now, I don't think that the, some people will look at this and they'll say, well, they need to be clothed with the righteousness of Christ in the sense that they're not saved and they, they need to be saved and, and take on the righteousness uh, uh, of Christ. I don't think this refers to a call uh, to be saved, uh, and, uh, but rather it's a call to holy character. Uh, a call to uh, the priorities that should ordain uh, a saint, the practical righteousness of Jesus, uh, to, to put on the kind of life that he lived and the speaking that, that he spoke. Uh, one commentator, I think, insightfully commented concerning them in this regard. He said, and did we not remind ourselves that in uh, chapter 1, verse 16, yes, there are seven stars in the hand of Christ. If it weren't for that, we might well doubt whether uh, she is a true church at all. But she was. And, uh, and they were. And, and so to be found, again, physically naked in that culture would have been a cause for great shame. And uh, they made a, a great deal of money 
uh, clothing the rest of the world with uh, the clothing that came from their wool and these kind of things. And Jesus reminds them again of a shame that's greater than being caught physically naked uh, in uh, this world, and that is to be found uh, spiritually naked in the eyes uh, uh, of heaven. And their spiritual nakedness was there for the whole world to see. They, they should have been ashamed, uh, but they weren't. And uh, as the whole world coveted their uh, wool black uh, garments, they should have uh, had a uh, greater desire uh, to clothe themselves in their spiritual nakedness with uh, the life and the practices of Jesus. He said uh, also in verse 18, he commended them to anoint their, uh, their eyes with eye salve that you may see. Again, remember they're famous for this eye salve, and, uh, but they needed a cure for their spiritual blindness. And so uh, the, the Holy Spirit's anointing uh, uh, their eyes in order for them to have a capacity to see the world in, uh, through spiritual uh, eyes. And then he called on them in verse 19 to be zealous. And the word means to be zealous. It carries the idea of warmth, the idea of heat in a relationship uh, with God and concerning the things of God, that that is the only attitude uh, that is worthy of God. And I think it's good uh, to be uh, reminded of that fact. I'm certainly glad for the reminder uh, that we are to be hot or we to, are to be zealous in our relationship with the Lord and toward the things of God in this world. And then he called on them in verse 19, to repent, to have a change of mind about where they are in their uh, spirituality or lack of it, and, and then turning their lives around toward God. And, and the whole, everything could change. They weren't hopelessly kind of mired or stuck in this. Everything would change if they would just repent of the things that they were doing that was feeding into this lukewarm uh, Christian life. So it infuses hope here. Uh, it, it wasn't a hopeless situation. Uh, just to, uh, just to uh, the, the change was just a decision away. And then in verse 20, he, there's a call uh, uh, to each one of them as individuals to open up the door of their lives uh, to him for fellowship that they would hear his knock upon the door uh, of their hearts, open the door and allow him to come in and dine with them, to give him the place in their lives that he deserved. And after all, Christianity, that's what it is. It is a relationship uh, with God. It is a relationship with Jesus Christ. So when he talks about coming in and dining with uh, them, uh, th uh, that was a very kind of intimate um, uh, experience in the ancient world. It wasn't just driving through a drive through and scarfing down the food and keep on with what we're trying to get uh, done that day or, or that uh, evening. Eating a meal was not about the meal supremely. It was about the fellowship. It was about the relationship with the person that the meal was shared with. And that's what he's, that's what he's asking them to do. And invite me uh, in in this uh, in, in this place and uh, so the, and into this place of relationship with you. It's interesting in verse 20 that uh, the words anyone and him and he they're all in the singular form. At this point when he knocks on the door of that church he's not talking to them collectively because a, a, a church is made up of individuals. He is calling on individual members of that church to make that, the decision, though in the midst of that church, to come to him uh, in, uh, in this way and open up the door. Uh, everyone has to decide individually what we'll do with this invitation of Jesus. His motive that he gives here behind what is really a, such a strong rebuke uh, is love. He says, I, it, I only rebuke and chasten who I love, who I care about. And again, he infuses hope here 
in, in this situation. Now, when you look at the, the statement that Jesus makes and he says, uh, I will vomit you out of my mouth uh, because of uh, how, how sick their spiritual condition uh, made him. But, but never think that's the most astonishing line within the letter. Uh, this is the most astonishing line in the letter in the light of that. And that is that He would love us enough to chasten us and to rebuke us when we find ourselves in that condition. And so, uh, behind all of this is the fact that He still loves them in us. There's still hope for them but they've got to wake up and to repent. And not only is there a chance now for them to enjoy a zealous Christian life, the full Christian life that Jesus has provided to us, but there is also a chance to earn the overcomer's reward as he describes it there in verses 20 and 21. The overcomer is the person who hears Jesus' instruction here and then obeys it. And Jesus said to such a person that he will grant that one uh, to sit with him on his throne as he also overcame and sat on his father's throne. In other words, the overcomer will have the privilege of ruling uh, under Jesus and serving him uh, during the kingdom age, the thousand year reign of Christ uh, and beyond. And to possess that promise to have that be one day be our portion as Christians. Just that small little snippet of eternity is worth more than uh, anything else that they were striving for in life. And Jesus overcame uh, all through simple obedience to the Father, and they would, over, uh, would uh, overcome through their simple obedience to Jesus' instruction here. He closes it with an exhortation for those uh, who haven't uh, ear to hear to hear what the Holy Spirit says to the church. And so lukewarmness. Is one of the, this is, Laodicea is one of the two letters that Jesus has uh, two churches he has nothing good to say to. So there's no putting a perky thing on this thing. Uh, He's not intended to to do that. There's hope hope of plenty in it, Uh, but but you don't uh, just talk it away as if this is just uh, sermon fodder that God has provided for us in, uh, in, in the Bible. Lukewarmness in a Christian is an affront to Jesus. It's an affront to heaven. And it is a danger to the body of Christ. I can't speak for you, but I need to hear that every once in a while. I need to hear that. I need to allow that to impact me so I don't settle into a lukewarm, going through the motions kind of Christianity. And it doesn't just happen. This uh, zealous uh, life that we live for Christ, uh, a, a, uh, a, a warm, a hot relationship with, uh, with God, an attitude toward the things of God. It doesn't just happen. There's reasons that, uh, that that zeal is lost, and there are ways in which that zeal returns to our lives if it is uh, lost. And it's always the result of neglecting, as we've seen, my personal relationship with the Lord. It is neglecting the person and the work of the Holy Spirit in the Christian life. The the necessary place of learning the Bible in the Christian life. The necessary place of giving in the Christian life. The necessity of Christian service in the Christian life. The necessity of God-centered worship in the Christian uh, life. And so nobody wants to leave this place and and for us to leave the letter of the Church of Laodicea and say, I want to stop being a lukewarm Christian, but I don't know how to do it. And so he tells us how to do it, built right into the letter. And all of that neglect can change in a moment with a decision for me just to repent 
and, and to return to giving these things uh, the, the needed place in my life a, as a Christian and, and, uh, and the zeal that honors God and blesses, uh, blesses us will, will uh, become a part of our lives uh, once again. It's a strong letter. It's a needed letter. I think especially in our age in which uh, even within uh, Christianity in some pockets that what Jesus is describing here uh, can oftentimes be thought of as, as mere uh, legalism and, and uh, uh, rather than realizing no, this is what Christianity is intended uh, to be. And so if you sit here this morning and, and you are in a lukewarm condition, uh, uh, nobody's going to throw stones at you. Jesus didn't throw stones at anybody here. But I want you to know there'll be pastors and other men and women up in front after the church. And you could say, hey, I'd like to pray to be refilled with the Holy Spirit and to get going on this thing. I've fallen asleep at the wheel on, on this. Or maybe if that's not your cup of tea, to just, it looks like we've got a, a cold day, but a nice day, sunny day, to just take a walk today and sort these things out with the Lord. He'll meet us wherever we uh, 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 desire to have Him meet us on, on all of this. And then if you sit here this morning and you're not yet a Christian, uh, the same th salvation occurs the same way by Jesus knocking on the door of our hearts, wanting to come in, begin a relationship with us. And if you're not a Christian this morning, you've been created by God for a relationship with God. That's the whole purpose of your life. And because that's the whole purpose you've been created for by God, you will never find satisfaction anywhere else. There will always be the sense there must be something more to life than I have experienced. And because until I become a Christian, there is something more to life than I have experienced. And it's the most important thing. And so for you, we would love to answer your questions and pray with you to become a Christian here this morning. And that is something that happens in an instant in time as well. Let's stand together now and we'll close in prayer. Jesus, we are so grateful for your love. I don't know where we could turn in life to our parents, uh, to our relatives, to even the best of our friends who would ever tell us the truth like you're willing to tell us. And so we just embrace this letter, Lord. We know we're not all in this place in our life, but we're grateful to have this correct in our lives, what needs to be corrected, and to also have affirmed in our lives what needs to be affirmed as we're trying to walk with you and live for you in this funny old world that we live in. Thank you for this letter, Jesus. Thank you for being with us as we studied it. And we thank you in your name. In Jesus' name, amen.